Welcome. This forum is for general election candidates for Tacoma School District positions one and two. They are six year terms. The candidates are for position one, Lisa Keating and Debbie Winskill. And for position two, Christopher Kearns and Enrique Leon. The timekeeper, Susan Eidenschink of the League of Women Voters, will enforce timing rules so that each candidate is given the same amount of time to answer all of the same questions. The questions will be asked by members of the Community and Neighborhood Councils of Tacoma and have been prepared by the Community Council and the League of Women Voters. Um, we have one question from the audience which will be asked by Aviva Lemberger of the League of Women Voters. Candidates each have one minute for an opening statement. We begin with Lisa Keating. Hi, my name is Lisa Keating. I'm running for um, Tacoma uh, School Board position one. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Tacoma. I'm a proud parent of a Tacoma Public School student. Um, and I have been a community partner with the district for 10 years through the Whole Child Initiative. And in the last eight years, I've been facilitating an anti-bullying program that I created that is centered in art, community service, and team building. And I've been doing that work um, at a number of schools around the district, um, which allows me to be in the class classrooms, working alongside teachers and staff, and also um, facilitate enrichment programming during school and after school. Um, I've been involved on numerous committees and, re and um, lobbying or legislating, or excuse me, advocating um, at the legislature on behalf of implementation of policy and legislation um, to better improve our schools and the safety of our students. And it would be an honor to serve as the next school board, school board director. Thank you. Debbie Winskill. Hello. My name is Debbie Winskill. I am currently serving in position one on the Tacoma School Board. I have lived most of my life in Tacoma. My children all graduated from Tacoma Public Schools. My grandchildren are there currently. I am very interested in um, what we can do to further the education of all of the children who are still in our schools. We are the fifth highest employer in the city. Uh, that many people don't know. We have a budget even higher than the city and the county. Um, we're an important entity. I actually have uh, been involved since I've been on the board in a lot of arts organizations, which I think are very in, uh, important for um, keeping our children encouraged and in school, and as well as um, extracurricular activities. And I am uh, looking for another term to try to help make good decisions for the children of Tacoma. Thank you. Christopher Kearns. My name is Christopher Kearns. I'm running for school board position two. I'm a lifelong uh, Tacoma resident. I went through Tacoma Public Schools. I have two children in Tacoma Public Schools. Um, really all I'm looking to do is advance education in our community, making sure that we're taking the appropriate steps to make sure that our kids are going to be well prepared for our community and society moving forward and make sure that we have a model of education that reflects that. Thank you. Enrique Leon. Thanks, Enrique Leon. And I am really, really passionate about trying to improve kids' academic success. And I bring the experience and the lens of someone who works in the healthcare field. I've been an um, assistant professor of family medicine at University of Washington teaching medical students and residents. Um, but really, the important part of uh, what I have to offer is uh, improving the physical and emotional health of the kids. Uh, so they can uh, really, really uh, accentuate and improve their academic performance and be safe in schools. I am from Peru, um, and I was born uh, monolingual Spanish, learned English in public school in the United States in ELL class. I went in Maryland and then came out to Tacoma to practice uh, for the past 20 years, uh, 25 years from Seattle to Tacoma. I've been uh, living here, really love the community. And my kids have been and are in uh, Tacoma Public Schools throughout their career. And uh, my family is really just uh, full of educators. I really have been brought up with the education um, gene and love and desire to help improve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. We move on to questions. The questions will be asked by Liz Burris and Ginny Eberhardt of the Community Council of Tacoma. If I don't specify otherwise, you have up to 60 seconds to answer. The order of answering rotates with each question. Therefore, Debbie Winskill will answer the first question first, and Liz Burris will ask the question. Good morning. Good morning. 
How do we create a climate in our schools to lessen the incidence of bullying? And what steps would you take to ensure that the school district enforces its zero tolerance policy? And what is the correct response to a student who continues bullying? So um, we take bullying very seriously. And I think that uh, it starts at the top with the principal and their vision and giving that vision to the teachers. And if that doesn't happen at the top, then the school is not going to be complying with some of the rules in the way that we think is um, possible. We do have a team of people who address these issues. So if they're not addressed properly at the school level, they're addressed downtown. And we have a, a someone in charge right now who is w really great and he helps to deal with uh, families and uh, to get a good resolution. But I do think also bringing the families in and letting them know what's going on is important because sometimes a family member could correct that behavior if they knew that it was happening at school. And so for long-term problems, um, with a repeat, um, I just think taking the student aside and uh, just, you know, giving them, well, talking to them and having them see the other point of view is uh, actually can work rather than bullying them further to be better and to not be a bully. But. So with respect to bullying, you know, it's really important that we identify the root cause. And so I, what I would propose is that we introduce more counselors and more uh, training for our teachers to recognize the symptoms of bullying and then investigate how, you know, what's the root cause? Is there trouble at home? Um, is it self-esteem issues? Um, really focus on that. Um, I know that they have a new curriculum, which is the social emotional learning. I think that'll pay huge dividends. With respect to the zero tolerance policy, I don't think that's a good policy. Um, I think that it disproportionately um, punishes kids of minorities and um, and I don't think it's, I think it's a, I just think it's a bad policy. I think that we need policies that are more inclusive and understanding of the actual issues at hand. Thank you, Enrique Leon. So uh, I agree the social emotional learning uh, curriculum that we purchased last year is really going to improve upon the uh, education piece that kids will learn how to interact with each other, uh, how to um, prevent bullying, and when bullying occurs, how to deal with it in a responsible way. Uh, that also includes uh, uh, the teachers, the counselors, of course, um, increasing those numbers uh, to be able to support these kids as they struggle through some of these very difficult topics, uh, which really cause their anxiety, depression issues that then impact their ability to learn. This is why this is the, their safety piece that is, if not present, um, kids aren't able to learn very well. The uh, zero tolerance issue, uh, I agree, is something that we don't want to um, single out um, kids from certain uh, demographics, uh, socioeconomic groups, uh, because they have been singled out for way too long. So we want to decrease that. Uh, if someone continues bullying, though, we do need to be more intensive and proactive about looking at um, the reasons why that's happening and bring them together with parent conferences and bring counselors in and um, interpreters if needed. Thank you. Lisa Keating. Um, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And one thing that I would, I think is important to understand that when we talk about bullying, bullying is a really broad term and there are several components to it and helping students to understand the differences between harassment, intimidation, and those two pieces combined repeatedly then um, become bullying. And so bullying is a word that is used a lot and I think it, we also need to be informing our students to understand the, the differences and understand how do we take a step back to understand what is the root cause of the behavior. And I think that the district has also, I work really closely with um, counselors throughout the district on safety and inclusion. And I think the practices of restorative justice in terms of helping um, understand your impact versus your intent and educating students to be able to resolve their own conflicts in a safe environment so that it doesn't ostracize the behavior, but also is an opportunity to educate and bring students to a better understanding so that they can mutually respect and honor each other's um, uh, who they are and in, the, in their school community and identity. Thank you. Ginny Eberhardt, your question goes to Christopher Kearns first. 
Do you believe our schools have adequate security? If not, what ideas do you have for improving security? And how do we do this without terrifying the students and staff? You know, so part of the reality is we live in a society where children are targets. Um, and that's unfortunate, so we need to make sure that we are taking the appropriate steps to ensure uh, the children's safety as well as the staff's safety. Um, I do think that we are taking the appropriate measures with the new, uh, the new schools that have been developed. They're implementing these envelope access with key cards, and they're really trying to create in, like inviting environments in, in, into the entry of schools while also maintaining levels of appropriate measures for security and access. Um, I know that the new bond measure that will be coming out, um, we've heard a lot about that and how that's really aimed at improving those types of um, security measures school-wide. Again, that's reactionary. I'd rather focus also on um, you know, those types of behaviors that lead to those transgressions. And I think that, you know, making kids aware um, and stuff like that at a younger age is a, a successful strategy in that. Thank you. Enrique Leon. So the, the majority of the safety issues that have occurred um, in a lot of schools have happened from within. So it's been uh, usually a, not always, but always, uh, many times a bullied child um, or something from the community that's uh, taken retribution back on that on that school. So really, this goes back to counselors, the social emotional learning component of identifying and being able to. Um, know when someone is in distress, the early signs of distress, so you can prevent someone from becoming violent. Um, part of this is re, um, keeping and increasing our numbers of counselors. The school nurses um, are lower than we should have. Uh, and also school-based health centers is something I'm very passionate about also to try to include those in all high school levels. Um, we have one at Oakland High School that I was uh, helped implement this past year. I'd like to try to pull, push that out to all the conventional high schools. You have a physician, a mental health pr provider in those schools to help those students. That's just at the high school level, but we also need to focus in elementary and uh, middle school with regard to the counselors. Thank you. Lisa Keating. Um, I actually, uh, my daughter just experienced a lockdown yesterday, um, and we got the text of, Mom, we're in a lockdown. Um, and as a, as a parent, it's really terrifying um, to not, there's that reaction of wanting to go and rescue, but also acknowledging and, and having faith that the systems that are in place, um, I, I really trusted the staff at her school that whatever the situation was, that they were going to be handling it. Um, and I fully agree that um, we need um, more counselors need to have more interaction with students. I think I believe that if we were to um, have trauma-informed care training for not just teachers but also for office staff and for um, support staff, that that would be an additional support in terms of like having health centers and other. Um, uh, avenues, you know, restorative justice, all of these things, I think we need to have a really complex approach to um, prevention on uh, violence prevention in general and helping students feel seen and supported and that they have access to resources. Thank you. Debbie Winskill. So, <clears throat> um, there's several ways to look at this. First of all, some of the uh, lockdowns that occur are because something's happening in the neighborhood, not in the school. And Sometimes it is something that's happening in the school. Some schools are really good about um, sending home a message immediately because it's on the news. You hear about it while it's happening on the news. I heard of one of one of our schools on Cairo Radio a few weeks ago before I ever got notified by the school. So if the principal sends out a message immediately saying it's something in the neighborhood, um, I think that goes a long ways to helping people. Now, as far as um, uh, we are working really hard uh, to secure our schools. We have uh, police officers in our high schools and security guards in our middle school and high school. And um, as far I know that there's a lot of fear. Um, I've been reading the articles nationwide about all the lockdown drills, and I think that's something we should revisit and see uh, how we should um, approach that in the future. And if we're overdoing it and if it's causing anxiety, we need to modify what we're doing. Thank you. Liz Burris, Enrique Leon will answer your question first. How do you envision helping homeless students 
to succeed and graduate? What programs and supports should we have to help them succeed? Our homeless students are uh, extremely important. Um, so any socioeconomically deprived group uh, is going to have so many more barriers, and being homeless is probably the, the, one of the biggest barriers present. So um, ex expanding upon and including our, our counselors, specifically um, outreach team, the McKinney-Vento team, that uh, unfortunately we lost some of our school um, members uh, in that team this past year. Uh, they were um, kind of, um, so they, they were redeployed to the, the central administration office, but we are working hard to try to get them back out into the schools. But we really need more support um, also from uh, Olympia, but also ourselves to redeploy those those uh, specialists to those students, um, providing them with resources, connecting them to um, the Arlington House, which is one of the newer um, uh, living facilities kind of uh, for uh, homeless youth in our community in the east side, uh, providing them with food, lunches all year long and weekends. We're doing some of that currently, but we know we're not reaching um, all students all the time. So I think we do need to focus on this more. Thank you. Lisa Keating. Um, I, this is something that I've been really concerned about, um, and the McKinney-Vento liaisons, who are the ones that um, support students experiencing homelessness, there were two um, that we had, actually one, a third one that was um, supported through a grant, but all three of those positions have been um, displaced or lost to the district as of this last um, school year. And at the end of 20, the 2018-2019 school year, there were 1,800 identified um, students experiencing homelessness. And I think that the project that um, Director Leon had mentioned um, and the partnership with the Tacoma Community, or yeah, Tacoma Housing Authority, excuse me, um, is critical in building additional um, partnerships with those agencies that serve um, um, ex our populations that are experiencing homelessness is really important. But I think it's critical to bring back the resources that we lost um, that and so that those, those existing students that we already know about don't continue to fall under the or fall through the cracks. Thank you. Debbie Winsco. Um, we, we do have homeless in um, Tacoma and we do um, have people who are dealing with them. We actually hired someone last night on the agenda. So I get, think we're replenishing some of those uh, as funds come in, which is good. Um, one of the key factors I think is um, mobility. And one of the things that the federal law allows or has us do is a bus people um, from the, wherever they are to um, the school they've been attending. And stability in uh, schooling is so important to um, people being successful in the future because there's nothing worse than having to change schools for our students. It's a, um, so if they have the same place to go all the way through, their, um, their graduation rates are higher. Thank you, Christopher Kearns. Yeah, just reiterate everything that really has been said is, you know, you need to strengthen the schools by, you know, making sure that the resources are available to these kids. Um, in addition, I would put more emphasis on vested community partners, you know, YMCA's, food kitchens, housing authority partners, um, and just making sure that outside of the school, because again, the kids are only on campus for eight hours a day, you got to make sure that they're being looked after the rest of the time. So really partnering with community partners to help fill those needs and fill those gaps would, I think, be a successful strategy. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Ginny Eberhardt, and it goes to Lisa Keating first. Okay. Do you think it is possible to fix the school lunch debt and how? And we're hearing that children who cannot pay are getting different lunches from those who are able to pay. Do you think that's fair? Um, I think that um, some of the, the lunch debt that um, has been accrued has is a result of the legislation that was passed to try and eliminate lunch or food shaming. Um, and I think that it's also important, like we are talking about lunch specifically, but that also includes breakfast because there are many families that rely on both breakfast and lunch. Um, and I think that's an important piece to include. Um, I feel like there are, the district is taking some really strong measures to try and get as many students 
students to sign or families to sign up for free and reduced lunch, which is something that I think was a gap last year. So it is a preventative measure that is being implemented currently. And I think that that's a really good um, step forward. I also think that we need to go back and advocate with our legislature so that we can have um, better funding for um, school lunches. And I think that we, we could have a, a more in-depth conversation about the quality of food that students are fed to. I think that's an important conversation that's generally not talked about. But I do know that, that a lot of these steps were in an, in an attempt to eliminate food shaming. We haven't gotten it that yet, but I think that there is progress being made. Thank you. Debbie Winskill. So it used to be that people were given a sack lunch if they did not have the money to pay. And uh, over a year ago, the legislature came in with a new mandate that we must serve hot lunches to everybody who came forward and not ask for money. And it really surprised so many districts statewide. They had uh, enormous debt immediately of people um, who, could not, who could not pay and some who just did not pay. So it's a sort of a two-pronged um, problem. When people sign up for free and uh, free or reduced lunch, they sign up they can sign up without anyone at the school knowing that they're signing up. And I think we have to get that word out because some people are embarrassed about it. And there are food cards now where people can buy them um, and so no one really knows whether it's free and reduced or they're just buying uh, a lunch with one of these cards. So it um, doesn't shame them any further. Thank you. Christopher Kearns. <clears throat> uh, so essentially, you know, the quality of food I think we need to talk about as well. But really, you know, access to food should be a no-brainer. Kids need food to be healthy, right? They need to be healthy to learn. You know, it's all intimately inter, um, intertwined. With respect to the policies that are with it, it just needs to be improved. I can't really think of something off the top of my head, but it's, it's just bad. So, yeah. I know they've taken steps at Point Defiance to where our PTA picks up the tab, um, but a lot of schools in our community don't have that strong of a PTA or don't have those resources. I think in a district where you have a high number of Title I schools, maybe we should look at auto-enrolling everybody into free and reduced lunches in those schools might be a way. And then if they want to opt out of it, I know that that's been something that I've heard talked about. Um, I think those all sound like good ideas. Thank you. Enrique Leon. Thanks. Caring for the vulnerable in our society is one of the most important things that uh, I think we all should really focus in on. That's what I've um, done my whole career in, in practicing in underserved communities. So uh, when it comes to food um, debt, we'll call it food because it's all it's breakfast and lunch, um, we, um, uh, Director Winskill's correct, we give everybody the, the, the warm lunch, the same lunch now. Uh, but there are ways to improve upon this with regard to uh, and things we're looking at from other districts, Piala being one, where you uh, bring everybody in so it's an opt out. You're already opt. You're, you're already in, uh, and you have to kind of opt out if you say no, no, I don't want their free and reduced lunch. Especially people that had it the year before, you know, they're probably probably uh, circumstances didn't change. So putting them in that in that category so that we don't have that debt from the state. A lot of these pet families uh, would. Um, would qualify. They just haven't filled out the forms and be able to do that in time. So we're not sending people to collections either, which is something something that someone thought was happening uh, in the past. We, we confirmed that that's not the case and not getting uh, lots of bad phone calls or anything. So uh, nutrition is an issue. We do have a, a I'll just, uh, we have an opening for a nutritionist uh, at the district right now. We Thank need you. One. <laughs> we have a question from the audience. It will be asked by Aviva Lemberger of the League and Debbie Winskill will answer it first. What are your views about placing students on separate tracks based on test scores? So this has been really controversial in the last uh, few um, years and actually a few months because we've been hearing a lot about Seattle. So we have to serve our students uh, from uh, every spectrum of their abilities, from the people who need special help to the people who are gifted and need help in that realm. And we get money for it, and it's mandated by the state. We do give a test to all second graders, and that actually used to be just to people who are identified, and now we give them to all second graders, so we try to identify people. Um, I have always thought that another way would be by teacher recommendation, and we do miss some students, and, I, and there are student teachers who are very surprised that the students do not um, test into those programs, and I think we should give a lot more play to what those um, 
uh, teachers say about their students? Uh, I think a one a one type a one size fit all approach doesn't work, and that's what really standardized testing does. I think we have a lot of kids that learn a lot of different ways, and although we do need a way to measure the kids, I think that looking for um, better strategies that are more accurate at identifying their ca their capabilities as learners is going to prove to be more of a successful strategy than a standardized test. Um, although, because funding is related to standardized testing, um, I just think that less weight needs to be put on it, and it needs to look be looked at and treated as a piece to the whole child, not the make all or be all. Thank you, Enrique Leon. We're testing our children too much um, in most of America, including this district. So I am very in favor of decreasing the amount of testing we're having on kids. And when it comes to basing um, tracks that will go on for long term on a test in second or fourth grade, you name it, even as they get older, it is not fair for that, that child, it's not fair for that family. We need to put way more emphasis on what the teacher and the parent and the kid themselves feel like they can do. You can use the test as part of the equation, but you know, make it less than 25% of whatever weight you're giving it to it, even less than that possibly. We gotta um, really focus in on kids as individuals and not as these numbers uh, that are being used. It's, sometimes it's, it's just faster and easier to try to use a number, but evidence shows that's not the best way to, to care for our, our, our students, uh, and it's really not uh, going to benefit them in the long run. I've had, we've had personal experience in my family with this, so I'm very sensitive to this, and I know uh, plenty of my, my patients' kids that I've worked through also have had problems with this. So. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa Keating. Um, I also agree with the over-testing, um, the comments that have been made. Um, I know that since my own child was really young, we started having conversations around the test result is not actually a reflection of what you actually understand and what you're capable of. And I feel like if when we're putting families in that position to try and help build our students up after they continue to experience um, uh, high-stakes testing and, and, and equate their own abilities to the numbers, I think that that's um, a disservice to our students. I think that we can also look at um, finding um, different ways to expose students in terms of different tracks. I think that we could collaborate with um, our trade industries and um, our technical colleges to allow for programs that are hands-on in our schools and start that earlier, not just in high school, and find, um, we have such amazing resources in Tacoma and Pierce County that I feel like we could really um, give students a really broad experience of what careers are up, um, possible and actually giving them more drive in, say, in, in the direction they feel they should go. Thank you. Christopher Kearns, you will answer the next question, which will come from Liz Burris first. What special experience would you bring to the school board and what do you hope to accomplish? Uh, special experiences. Um, so. What really got me involved is, again, uh, my passion for education. Education's been such a fundamental piece and pillar in my own life that um, I really think that's what's been the most attributed to my all the success I've had is just having a solid uh, education. Um, can you repeat the second part of the question? And what do you hope to accomplish? Okay. So what do I hope to accomplish by um, you know, up at the University of Washington, I've been fortunate to study, you know, evidence-based education and kind of how we teach education now at the undergraduate level. And kind of what I had sought out initially was to ensure that our high schools were adopting similar curricula to make sure that when kids, if they choose to Purdue, uh, pursue a secondary education, were uh, didn't face an additional barrier. Um, so that's, I'd like to implement strategies and educations in our middle schools and high schools to ensure that, you know, they're adopting those same curricula. Thank you. Enrique Leon. So I bring um, a, a critical eye to um, evaluating evidence-based uh, data and bringing it to the public in a way that is 
uh, easy to understand and consumable. So I do this with my patients um, every day. We teach our residents how to do this. It's important to have someone uh, who can communicate. And I feel like I have the leadership experience and the communication ability to bring different parties together. I, I work to, to get the HOPE 6 grant at Salishan when I work at Community Health Care uh, to rebuild that whole community um, and uh, to get the school-based health center uh, over at Oakland. That took uh, a lot of work. One, one of the other things I'm really excited to try to accomplish in my role is to delay the school start time for high schoolers and possibly middle schoolers. There's a plethora of, of evidence on academic success and medical success. And you'd think that you could just throw that information at everybody, everybody would jump on board, but that's not what happens. We need to really come together as a community, and I'm excited to be able to bring the, the I've brought the um, teachers union and the PTA um, to agree that we should study this formally. So this is something I want to want to accomplish. Thank you, Lisa Keating. Um, I think that one of the um, critical pieces that I would bring um, as a school board director is my experience um, of the implementation of policy. Um, I've been doing that work through building committees and on a district level for 10 years. And I've experienced and seen where the positive and the negative impacts of budget and policy decisions, how, are, how they play out in our classrooms and how they play out in our schools. So I would bring firsthand understanding of that and um, a critical eye to future, future policies that are um, decided upon. Um, I also fully um, support the late sign, um, shifting um, late start for, or the time start for high school and middle school. Um, I think that it, um, in, in looking at social emotional um, wellness for our students, that is a key component. Um, and I also hope to increase the transparency and accessibility, accessibility to the board so that we can be in better communication and dialogue with our community. Thank you, Debbie Winskill. So when I first got on this board, I had been very active in um, uh, school th through PTA and also on different committees, um, district-wide committees. But it took me about two and a half years to really learn everything there was to know about the schools. It's very complex. Um, I, you have to inter intervene or interact with the state and uh, federal and you um, interact with the legislature and the State Board of Education, which I have done and will continue to do. Um, I feel like I am uh, interested in a variety of things for education. Now, I am really interested in academics. Those have it's been my big passion and interest all these years of how, what makes uh, students succeed and how we uh, hook, them, hook the child and um, make them successful. And, um, uh, so I would hope to continue that and um, make good decisions for Tacoma. Thank you. This will be the last question. Enrique Leon will answer it first. And the question will be asked by Ginny Eberhardt. Historically, non-white students are not equally represented in our gifted programs. How would you correct this so more students are ready for and included in these programs? So bringing the... Uh, perspective of the teachers, the parents, um, uh, in regards to evaluating them um, and bringing their interest and piquing their interest. Um, the, the offerings are there. A lot, sometimes these families are, or kids are not encouraged enough to, to join uh, these uh, more rigorous uh, classes or tracks, you could say. Uh, a classic example is uh, our amazing teachers and program at FOSS for International Baccalaureate Program, um, which has been present for many, many years. The numbers there are small. We um, really could expand and should expand upon um, convincing and encouraging and then supporting once they're in these programs, these uh, kids of color and socioeconomic uh, areas, uh, place parts of town that are not um, have not been participating as much. Uh, transportation is also an issue because some some of these kids, once you get to the high school level, we've got choice schools like the Sammy and Soda and Idea, uh, and yes, they are they are in different parts of town, but some of the kids may not want to go to some of those. So transportation is key. Thank you, Lisa Keating. Um, I would also add to that, uh, representation really matters in terms of if a student doesn't see themselves in whatever academic environment they're in, they're not going to actually feel that that's for them or that they can participate in that. And that also comes from making sure that curriculum represent has diverse, if they're talking about um, 
people in history, for in civics, for example, like if you have you making sure that you're identifying leaders uh, that actually are also part of minority communities, so that students realize, oh, I didn't know that I could actually do that, that I had that opportunity. And I think that that's really where it starts with making sure that they see themselves in the curriculum that they're being taught, that the people in the front of the room also look like them as well. I think that's a really critical piece, um, because if we don't see ourselves in an environment, then we actually don't feel we're a part of it. So I think that that is a um, part of the root work that needs to be done to increase um, access and um, participation for students of color. Thank you. Debbie Winsco. We have increased in our high school with the AP offerings. So we, um, they're lar very large. I know Lincoln has had over a thousand students taking AP exams last year. So, uh, so we are on the right track in that respect. But now, as I mentioned earlier, for elementary and into gifted, we are opening some of those classes up. Um, we have some uh, multi-age classes. And I think they're, they're for test. We actually use testing to put some students in, but I think that we open them up to others also. And I do agree that teachers, like I said earlier, should be the ones who help the, to direct the students and tell the parents about um, the programs that are available out there. Thank you. Christopher Kearns. I think it really starts with early access. I think that in lower socioeconomic and minority populations, ensuring that they have equal and equitable access to programs like Head Start you know, and really getting kids off on the right foot and getting them um, exposed to education early, early, early in life will pay huge dividends because uh, traditionally that's typically why white students do better is because they have early access. You know, um, early exposure to anything in life tends to, you know, last and be successful. So I think that taking strategies to bolster access to early education opportunities and those types of uh, communities would be huge. Thank you. <clears throat> now you each have up to one minute for closing statement. Reversing our opening order, Enrique Leon will give the first closing statement and then we go down the road that way. Thank you for the opportunity to um, speak with you today. And it's really been an honor to serve for the past uh, year and a half on the board. I know that there are many challenges that we still uh, face, and I'm ready to take those on. I'm passionate, I'm a, I'm a strong leader, and I can communicate across uh, different uh, aspects of our, of our, of our um, community, including the board. Tengo la, la capacidad, tengo un bueno ejemplo de liderazgo, y también uh, yo sé cómo hablar a la gente y los directores. So I know how to really um, communicate, have a good relationship with our superintendent and uh, the um, upper administration. I have great relationships with teachers at the school level. I've been a volunteer in, the, in my kids' schools for all through elementary school and also now in high school uh, on the sidelines. But I'm not just a yes person. I am there to ask critical questions. I will push on the issues that are important for our health and education of our children. And I am there to be a voice for you, and I, I am accessible. Uh, so, mucho poder para la comunidad latina y todos los uh, comunidades que no tienen representación. So, for all the Latino population, all the other populations that need uh, my support of all the, all the children in Tacoma. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Kearns. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, one thing I've learned from this process is that, you know, we all want what's best for our kids. Um, so I'm just excited to be up here on the stage with these candidates and just trying to push our community in the right direction. I think that speaks dividends to everybody up here. What I hope to accomplish is that Again, we don't become, the board doesn't become a rubber stamp. I, I think we do need to have accountability at the highest levels. Um, I, I don't want to live in the past. I think just moving forward, we need to set achievable and measurable goals so that we can have accountability. I think including transparency and accessibility are going to be huge to build the relationship between the schools and the community um, and really focusing on a community-based um, strategy to strengthen relationships, I think, would go to, uh, go to strengthen a lot of, or go to combat a lot of the issues that our schools are facing, because not any one of us alone up here can make a real difference. We really have to be engaging to the public and explanatory and exciting and engaging. So that's how you really make a difference. So thank you. 
Thank you. Debbie Winskill. <clears throat> so my time on the board, I have uh, had to make some independent uh, decisions that ne necessarily haven't gone along with the administration because the board is not part of the administration. We are here to represent the public, uh, the taxpayers, and the students, and to make good decisions. We never know what's going to come down the pike, like uh, saying that we have to serve all children hot lunches. and. Um, Every year there's something that happens that we have to react to and I feel like I am well qualified to uh, talk to the right people and find out the right solutions and I do go to the, visit the schools and talk to the teachers and make a lot of decisions based on what they are seeing in the classroom and I have grandchildren still in the district so I'm s super interested in what's going on in Tacoma and I hope to stay on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Keating. Um, it's been an honor to um, run um, for Tacoma School Board. Um, I've knocked on thousands of doors in the last five months and talked to countless numbers of voters. And one thing that I have learned is that Tacoma honestly cares about Tacoma Public Schools. They care about our students. Um, and I um, would like to an, um, continue to improve upon the whole child initiative and the investments that have been made in the last um, six years in that initiative. I also would like to ensure that every school and every student has access to um, up, um, state of the art um, learning environments, that it's not just in certain areas of the, um, the district, that it is district wide, and that equity is um, a very critical. Um, um, compass that um, drives all of my decisions. I've been a champion for families for 10 years, and it would be an honor to continue that work as a school board director. Thank you. Thank you. Enrique Leon and Christopher Kearns are candidates for Tacoma School Board position two. Debbie Winskill and Lisa Keating are the candidates for Tacoma School District position one. Thank you all for being here and answering our questions. Thanks also to our audience our timekeeper, our questioners, and to TV Tacoma. You are watching or here because you want your vote to be an educated one. Thank you. Now please don't forget to use that vote. Election day is Tuesday, November 5th. Ballots are due in a drop box by 8 p.m. that day or must be postmarked by that day. You have watched and listened. Now don't forget to vote. Thank you. <laughs>